journey across the globe from Scotland to China with world's greatest train ride videos. Experience the breathtaking thrill and adventure of authentic train travel as you follow the tracks to unique history, fascinating people, and breathtaking scenery. All aboard! Canada. From the Atlantic to the Pacific, this vast nation, one of the largest of the world, encompasses towering mountains, rolling prairies, the great lakes, and crashing shores. From this land have come great cities, abundant farms, and majestic dreams. In 1871, this expansive nation sought to link its scattered population by building the world's longest and costliest railroad. On November the 7th, of 1885 it was completed and in its thousands of miles of ribbon steel are told the story of a nation. Join me as we ride the Canadian, one of the last great trains of the world, on a journey back in time. When the Canadian Parliament promised its people a railroad to the Pacific in only 10 years' time, it was done to coax the people of British Columbia into the newly formed Confederation. B.C. agreed, and the builders started to work. Not surprisingly, it ran behind schedule and took 14, not 10 years, to complete. Soon after the last spike was driven on the southern route of the Canadian Pacific, the Grand Trunk started its own railroad to the north through the Yellowhead Pass. And simultaneously, the Canadian Northern, in competition, began its own route. And by the early part of this century, Canada had not one, but three different transcontinental tracks. The early steam trains crossed the prairies and mountains, hauling settlers, miners, and people of the east. The trains were slow and none too luxurious, but they were a vast improvement over the Carlton Trail that had moved pioneers and adventurers before. And then on April the 24th of 1955, 70 years after the first trains rolled west, the Canadian Pacific inaugurated one of the fastest and most luxurious trains of the world, the Canadian, a glittering new train of stainless steel featuring two observation dome cars, one with a bullet-shaped lounge, the last car on the train, and the Canadian's most distinctive feature. The train was an instant success. It was comfortable, fast, and passed through some of the most beautiful scenery of the world. But within a few years, jets were making the three-day trip to the west in only a few hours, and the public started to abandon the train. Via Rail, Canada's passenger rail service, operated the Canadian on the southern route of the CP until 1989, when they put the Canadian on the supercontinental's northerly route. At the same time, Via announced that they were investing $200 million in a program to completely restore this train. In Montreal at the Canadian National Yards, VIA is working to restore the rolling stock of one of the world's great trains. Rather than to purchase new equipment, it was decided to restore the elegant stainless steel cars that were built for the Canadian Pacific by the Budd Company of Philadelphia in the early 1950s. The cars are brought into the yard and completely overhauled. 
the old steam heating systems are replaced with new electric components that receive their power from the locomotive. The brakes, plumbing, and lighting systems are replaced, and each car is meticulously restored down to new carpets, wallpaper, window shades, and linens. When the cars are finished, they are tested, then put back together into a unit of usually 12 cars as a newly restored train, consisting of a baggage car, two coaches, the Skyline Dome, a dining car, six sleepers, and the trademark park car with its dome and bullet-shaped rear lounge. A total of 185 cars have been restored here at the St. Charles Yards, and the project is a testament to Canada and VIA's commitment to restoring and saving the best of the railway pass. The new route of the Canadian takes the northerly route of the old supercontinental. From Toronto, the train heads around the Great Lakes to Winnipeg, then west to Saskatoon and on to Edmonton. From Edmonton, the train climbs through the Rockies, stopping in Jasper, and then proceeds on to Kamloops as it rolls towards Vancouver on the Pacific Coast. The Canadian begins its westward journey in the city of Toronto. Toronto is Canada's largest city. It is the capital of Ontario and one of the truly great cities of the world. It stands on Lake Ontario, a glittering metropolis of steel and eye-catching architecture. It has a population of over 3 million people and includes 80 different ethnic groups. The UN cited Toronto as the most ethnically diverse city in the world. Dominating the skyline is the CN Tower. It looms over the city and has become Toronto's best known landmark. Toronto is one of North America's most active cities. The sidewalks are crowded with business people during the lunch hour, and at the end of the day, commuters use the city's extensive subway system, commuter rail services, and far-reaching public transportation as they return to their homes. It is a city that has exploded in a few short decades, from being a somewhat sleepy town to a dynamic, action-packed, world-class city. Canadian cities have done well in preserving their downtown cores. In most Canadian cities, vast indoor shopping malls have been built in the center of the downtown. The Eaton Center on Young Street is one of Canada's largest downtown shopping malls. It has helped to keep the central city a vibrant center of retail trade by bringing to the people of Toronto a style of shopping that has become expected. Canada's cold winters make these enclosed cities within cities great places to shop. The old city hall, built in 1899, stands next to the new city hall. Both are in the heart of downtown. Boating and sailing are popular activities during the summer months, and ferries cross the water to the many islands that stand just offshore. Toronto was started on the site of Fort York in 1793. Against a backdrop of the city skyline, a guide demonstrates how the muskets were loaded and used against the Americans during the War of 1812. When the war ended in 1815, the long era of friendly U.S. and Canadian relations began. But we're here to board the train. Downtown, only a short distance from the lake, stands Toronto's historic Union Station an imposing stone structure built jointly by the Canadian Pacific and the Canadian National in 1927. Across the street is the Royal York Hotel. This is Canada's largest hotel with 1,600 rooms. It was built in 1929 by the Canadian Pacific as a natural extension of their rail services. Here at the Royal York, we'll spend the night before our departure, and breakfast will be brought to us in our suite. 
the Canadian railroads built towering castle-like hotels across the nation that are as much a part of the railroad's history as the trains themselves. Shortly before our train is scheduled to depart, we'll call for the bellman. He'll arrive at our door and escort us and our luggage across the street into the station and take our bags directly to the train. Inside the cavernous main hall, the clock kicks off the minutes as the train is preparing to leave. On the board, all of the scheduled departures are listed, including ours, the number one train to Vancouver, the Canadian, Canada's transcontinental train. The ticket agents work quickly making changes. Unlike airline agents who arrange only seats, train agents handle the berths and must sort out sleeping car problems as well. The crowd gathers, awaiting the opening of the platform by the train personnel. Meanwhile, the train has arrived from the switching yard, and the VIA personnel are busy trackside loading the train. Fuel must be loaded in both locomotives, luggage is brought to the baggage car, and the stewards are busy tidying up the bedrooms and berths. The galley staff loads the food and supplies, which will be needed on this transcontinental trip to prepare meals for the passengers aboard the train. Once the preliminary preparations have been made, the station agent will open the platform and the passengers will stroll alongside the silver train looking for their compartments and cars. At 12.45, the conductor shouts, all aboard. The locomotives power up, the motors are engaged, and the Canadian pulls out of Toronto's Union Station on a journey that will end three days and 2,800 miles later on the shores of B.C. So sit back, relax, and welcome to the wonderful world of the train. From the observation car, passengers watch the city and suburbs roll by as the train makes its way north on its journey around the Great Lakes. As the day goes on, passengers gather in the parked car and meet their fellow travelers. At 5 o'clock, cocktails are made hors d'oeuvres are served, and the routine of the train begins. While passengers are having their dinner on the first night of our ride, the sleeping car porters are busy making up the berths. The Canadian has three types of sleeping accommodations. Sections, which are sleeping berths in the front part of the car, roomettes, where the single chair converts into a bed, and bedrooms, one of which you see here. Each bedroom has its own small bathroom, two chairs, and two berths. The steward makes up the beds by collapsing the chairs and lowering the bunks into place. The space is not large, but the bedrooms are comfortable and afford complete privacy and devoted train travelers will tell you there are a few things more relaxing than sleeping aboard a train. The following morning as the sun rises, we are passing over the Canadian Shield, the 700 mile wide slab of granite that separates the Great Lakes from Hudson Bay. Newspapers are picked up in the stations along the way, and passengers can relax in their berths and read the paper while the countryside rolls by. After enjoying breakfast in the dining car, passengers will spread out over the train. Some return to their private rooms, others head to the Skyline Dome car to play cards. Some talk or read, while others simply peer out of the window and watch the passing scenes. The weather is unpredictable. This morning rain rolls off the panoramic windows of the observation dome. 
At 11 a.m., we pull into Sioux Lookout, a small town above the Great Lakes. This is one of the service stops for the train. Here, passengers have about 20 minutes to get off and stretch their legs. The cars will be watered. Each car holds several hundred gallons of water, and at designated stops, water will be added to the tanks. The train is fueled here by a young woman. Via Rail has been a leader in employing women in non-traditional jobs. With the train fueled and watered, the conductor will call out all aboard, the passengers hustle onto the train, the stewards pull up the stairs, lock the Dutch doors, and the train is rolling again out over the shield from Ontario into Manitoba as we make our way west to the city of Winnipeg. The day passes quickly and the Canadian shield scenery of lakes and pines and granite walls turns into the prairies and then finally the skyline of Winnipeg. Winnipeg lies in the lower part of Manitoba. It is the provincial capital and home to 650,000 people. It is sometimes called the Chicago of Canada for it is the business center of the Canadian prairies. The Canadian pulls into Union Station on Main Street in the heart of town. Winnipeg has a modern skyline. New office buildings tower over the prairie land. At Union Station, we leave the train and head across the street to the Fort Gary Hotel. The bellman follows with our bags, much as we experienced at the Royal York in Toronto. The Fort Gary is one of Winnipeg's classic landmarks. It was built in the first part of the 20th century by the railroad and was designed in the famous chateau style. Because of its location, across from the station, it was for years a center of activity for this crossroads town. Today its ballroom has been converted into a casino, the only place in Canada where casino gambling is allowed. Winnipeg is a bustling city that reflects the fact that this is a city of business. This community serves the business and financial needs of the vast prairie lands. Grain is shipped here, the prices determined on the Winnipeg Commodity Exchange, and the banks and brokerage houses control much of the vast wealth the rich farmlands produce. The city is balmy and pleasant in the summer, but in winter it can be one of the chilliest places of the world. The corner of Main Street and Portage in Winnipeg is jokingly referred to as the coldest street corner on earth. A complex system of enclosed walkways interconnects many of the downtown buildings. Portage Place is a lavish multi-level shopping arcade completely enclosed and designed to encourage people to shop and browse on even the coldest days of the year. Winnipeg's best known store is The Bay a giant department store in the heart of town. Its name is actually the Hudson's Bay Company. It was incorporated in 1670, and the history of this store speaks of Winnipeg's early days. To the north of Winnipeg lies Lower Fort Gary. This fort was built on the Red River by Hudson's Bay Company. The company established this outpost to receive the furs caught by trappers who braved this unsettled and largely unexplored land. The Red River carts were used to haul the furs. They were also the primary means of moving goods west for the pioneers. They were to Canada, but the covered wagons were in the U.S. The carts were made only of wood. When the wheels turned, they created a deafening squeak that was said to have driven many settlers to distraction on the long trips west. Winnipeg was built on the Red River below the fort at the point where the Red and Assiniboine Rivers meet. Winnipeg arose on the west bank, St. Boniface on the east. The historic St. Boniface Basilica is one of many sites on this quiet and very French side of the river. This is the largest French-speaking community west of Quebec. The Mété, French Canadians who married natives, settled here and began Winnipeg's long tradition of ethnic diversity. The Ukrainian cathedral speaks of Winnipeg's second largest ethnic group. Their heritage is evident throughout the city. There are more Ukrainians in Winnipeg than any other place in the world outside of the Ukraine. 
Winnipeg is the capital of Manitoba, and the legislative building stands in the heart of town. It was built in 1919 in the neoclassical style. The golden boy atop the dome stands posed with a sheath of wheat in his hand, looking out over the vast prairie lands. Winnipeg is home to the Royal Canadian Mint. Here the coins of Canada are produced. The Centennial Concert Hall is the home of the Royal Winnipeg Ballet, one of the world's foremost dance companies. The people of Winnipeg have always supported the arts. Winnipeg is covered with parks. The green lawns and shade trees create a sense of restfulness in the summer months. Assiniboine Park on the western edge of town is Winnipeg's oldest park. It offers a variety of attractions, including a sculpture garden with the works of Leo Mall. Leo Mall is a Winnipeg artist whose work in bronze is recognized worldwide. He has gained international attention for his expertise at human detail. On the Red River, excursion boats pass regularly. Winnipeg has always been a transportation town. Its earliest days are, like so many Canadian towns, tied directly to the fortunes of moving people and goods. Billowing clouds of smoke moving across the prairies signaled the coming of the train. The Prairie Dog Central is Winnipeg's last steam train. It operates on an excursion journey today from Winnipeg's St. James Street Station out to Gross Isle. In the early 1900s, there were many of these trains that hauled people from Winnipeg out to Victoria and Winnipeg Beach, Manitoba's lakefront towns. The locomotive was built in Scotland in 1882 and is typical of the hundreds of locomotives that traveled the Canadian rails until the end of the age of steam. Winnipeg Beach, north of the city, is one of many lake communities that provided summer relief from the heat for the people of the town. It often comes as a surprise to visitors, but Manitoba is covered with enormous freshwater lakes. The lakes are huge, a part of the Great Lakes system, left behind by melting ice. Gimli, on the west side of Lake Winnipeg, is a commercial fishing port. Gimli is a part of Manitoba's varied ethnic heritage. This community is Icelandic and boasts the largest population of Icelanders outside of Iceland itself. It is also the Purple Martin capital of Manitoba. The towering Purple Martin houses stand near the harbor at the water's edge. But Winnipeg is mostly about business. This is a town of trade. New high-rise office buildings cover the downtown streets. Banks provide employment and financing and keep the wheels of commerce turning from the Great Lakes West. Winnipeg's comparison to Chicago is because of this, the Winnipeg Commodity Exchange. Like the Chicago Board of Trade, this exchange room creates and controls the fortunes of the grain-producing region. Here, the prices are set for the bushels and boxcars of everything from oats standing in a barn to crops that have not only not been harvested yet, they haven't even been planted yet. The prices are set, haggled over, and bid up and down on the floor of this exchange. Weather is vital, and charts showing rainfall in specific regions and forecasts for the months ahead are used by the traders in making their bids. At first glance, these trading floors always seem chaotic with no point of order. But there is, of course, a highly defined system of doing things here. And at the end of the trading day, all of the paperwork is processed and farmers, bankers and investors across Canada will have seen the value of their assets rise or fall. This exchange sets the heartbeat of the prairie's economic health. From Winnipeg, we now head west. The Canadian leaves Union Station through the Winnipeg Yards and heads out over the prairies on a track as straight as an arrow to our next stop at Saskatoon.
Operating the train is a highly skilled job. Like piloting a plane or guiding a ship, the engineer is ultimately responsible for the lives of hundreds of people on board the train. The locomotive is staffed by two people, an engineer and his assistant. In reality, they both take turns driving the train. The Canadian is pulled by two locomotives, though only the head engine is staffed. The engineer keeps his hands busy between the throttle, which has four positions, and the air brakes, which are the train's most critical component. Various gauges are monitored as the engineer keeps an eye on the machinery behind. The horn button announces the train to the road crossings ahead. The most closely watched instrument is the speedometer. The engineer constantly monitors the speed of the train, particularly as the signals and the track switches are approached. These giant locomotives are diesel-electric, F40s manufactured by General Electric in Hamilton, Ontario. Each produces 1,800 horsepower, and they operate by burning diesel fuel in generators that make electricity, which is used to power the traction motors that actually move the train. The system is efficient, dependable, and creates a smooth and more even ride. Our next stop is Saskatoon, Saskatchewan's largest city, located near the center of the province, northwest of Regina, the capital, 150 miles away. The train pulls in at dawn. The schedule calls for an arrival at 3 a.m., but a forest fire in Ontario has delayed this westbound train, and as a result, we are running several hours behind. Saskatoon is a surprise, a bustling prairie town built on the South Saskatchewan River, a city of bluffs, bridges, and wide tree-lined streets. The population is 185,000, and the community serves the retail, medical, and business needs of farmers and their families scattered over much of the province. Saskatoon's best-known site is a hotel the Castle Lake Besborough Hotel was built on the bluffs of the river in 1935 by the Canadian National, another of the great railway chateau hotels. But this community is defined more by what surrounds the town. Rich, abundant farms, acres and acres of prairie that in late summer glisten with golden wheat. Saskatchewan is a part of the rich plains of North America that begin in Texas and Oklahoma and reach north of Saskatoon. Livestock is raised on pasture lands, and the whole region is not much different from what you would find outside a Kansas town. The grain elevators of Canada stand like sentinels across the prairies. They hug the tracks, and boxcars of grain move from here to the four corners of the world. Canada's grain elevators are almost always of metal, square with pitched roofs, very different from the round concrete prairie skyscrapers found in the U.S. Saskatchewan was Indian land. Long before the European settlers arrived, nomadic Indians roamed these plains. Along the banks of the South Saskatchewan River, tribes would stay for extended periods of time. The Indians followed the buffalo herds. This was an ideal spot because of the river bluffs where the buffalo could be driven over the edge to their deaths below. Today at this spot, the provincial government has created a heritage park, Wanaskewan. It means seeking peace of mind. It is an interpretive Indian site where you can explore the land and wander through exhibits that tell the stories of the lives of these nomadic people. Their lives depended on the buffalo. These animals provided the Indians with everything they would need. At Wanaskewan today, native North Americans demonstrate dances, storytelling, and the use of beads. The beads were used for artistic expression, as well as currency on the plains. They were woven into intricate designs and were highly prized, traded, and given as gifts. Today at Wanaskewan, the University of Saskatchewan operates an extensive archaeological laboratory. Students of archaeology learn firsthand the patient skills a modern archaeologist needs. These were nomadic people, so nothing was moved unless it was needed. 
They left behind a rich treasure trove of pots, clothing fragments, and what was essentially their trash. Today, these discarded fragments of an early civilization yield answers about these people's lives and the movements and advancements of people over the North American plains. The nomadic people of North America left behind much to be discovered, and a great deal of modern archaeology involves uncovering, examining, and studying the movements of these tribes as we seek to understand how the North American continent developed and evolved. From Saskatoon, the train continues west. Our train tonight is running on time, and we will depart Saskatoon at 3.38 a.m. Not a convenient time, but the reality of cross-country trains is that some of the stops will inevitably be in the middle of the night. The awaiting passengers board, and the train heads out into the black, empty skies. The stewards are busy preparing the berths for passengers who have booked sleeping accommodations out of Saskatoon. This is a section. These are berths at the front of the sleeping car that are made out of daytime seating areas. The steward will lower the beds and make up the berths that line the corridor. To ensure privacy, he'll hang heavy canvas curtains on both the upper and the lower berths. Changing into your pajamas behind these curtains has challenged travelers since the first sleeping car started to roll. The night passes and the following morning as the sun rises over the prairies, we are heading west, leaving Saskatchewan and entering the eastern plains of Alberta. Breakfast is a great time on board the train. The smell of the bacon, the rocking of the dining car, and the chattering of the rails make for an unusual and interesting way to start your day. In the galley, the chef will flip pancakes on the griddle using balancing skills that are unique to a train. The train is filled with travelers from around the world. Young and old, couples, families, and single people all meet on board the train. The space is small, and you can't help but meet and make new friends. Families with children are always a welcome sight. What could be more magical for a child than a ride on a train? As the train heads west, the morning activities begin. Stewards roam the corridors, looking for rooms where the passengers are temporarily gone, so they can stow away the berths. In the morning, the beds are stripped and tucked away. The chairs put back out, and the bedroom once again becomes a private sitting room. This procedure of changing from a sitting to a sleeping room goes on twice a day, every day the train is rolling along. Sometimes the public areas are quiet and empty, and passengers will have the space all to themselves. The conductor is the most important person on the train. Passengers sometimes assume the engineer driving the train is the number one person, but not so. The engineer and everyone else on board answers ultimately to the conductor, who is the true captain of the train. The conductor has many jobs. He takes tickets, but handling the paperwork is the more time-consuming task. He must also monitor the timetable, hustle the staff to move the train out of the station quickly when it's running behind, handle staff problems, passenger complaints, and in general, keep the train rolling along. He is the most influential person on board, and he has the ultimate say on the operation of the train. From Saskatoon, we head west into Alberta and out over the eastern plains of this varied province. The terrain starts to rise as we approach our next stop, the city of Edmonton. Edmonton is Alberta's capital. It lies north of Alberta's other large city, Calgary. Both are oil towns. Edmonton is the older of the two, started as a fort before the railroad arrived. The Canadian pulls into the station right on schedule at 8.35 a.m. Edmonton stands on the North Saskatchewan River. Its skyline is new, glittering, and tall. The town reflects the economic impact Alberta oil has had on Canada's west. This is the provincial capital, and the legislature building in the center of town is impressive and bold. 
Edmonton's strategic location earned it the title of Gateway to the North. Thousands of tons of food, medical supplies, and mail passed through Edmonton on its way to Canada's northwest in the early days. The Grand Trunk Railway built the imposing McDonald Hotel on a cliff overlooking the river. Today, this property has been restored much like the Canadian itself. In front of the hotel on Saturday nights, a bagpiper welcomes guests who are staying and dining in this grand old hotel. The lobby is hushed and dramatic. Through these corridors have passed thousands of men and women of Edmonton's social and business world. On Sundays, the Mac, as it is affectionately known, welcomes Edmonton people with a lavish Sunday brunch served in the grand ballroom of the hotel. Brunch at the Mac has been popular in Edmonton since the hotel was restored. The setting is one of the most elegant to be found between the Great Lakes to the east and the Rocky Mountains to the west. Ten minutes from downtown in Edmonton's picturesque river valley is Fort Edmonton Park. Canada's largest historical park. This is a historic settlement where each street represents a different decade of Edmonton life. Four different areas tell of Edmonton when it was a fur trading post, a gold rush town, a turn of the century ragtime city, and a roaring 20s town. Several attractions emphasize the role of transportation. Stagecoaches, wagons, and trolleys are a part of this historical park. Here you can ride an old-fashioned streetcar, just like the type that once ran down Jasper Avenue, Edmonton's main street. A steam train rumbles along another of the giant locomotives that originally conquered the Canadian West. manned by an engineer and a fireman, just like the modern-day Canadian. Except on these old trains, the fireman's job was just that. He stoked the boiler and kept the fires hot so the engine would make steam and keep the train rolling along. But Edmonton's biggest attraction is the West Edmonton Mall. When you see the replica of a Spanish galleon, you'll know this is no ordinary shopping mall. This is the largest shopping mall in the world. It cost over $1 billion to build. It covers 5 million square feet, the equivalent of 115 football fields. It includes 800 stores, 110 restaurants, 19 movie theaters, a zoo, an amusement park. The whole thing is staggering in its size. There is a dolphin lagoon with four Atlantic bottlenose dolphins, a giant skating rink open year-round, and enough attractions to keep you busy for a month. The World Water Park includes the world's largest indoor swimming pool, complete with a wave-making machine and huge water slides. It's a giant enclosed Coney Island in the Canadian North. And what would a shopping mall be without bungee jumping? Yes, you can buy a car or a pair of sneakers and jump off of a monstrously high perch and bounce up and down. And if that isn't enough, there's a full-scale amusement park with merry-go-rounds, Ferris wheels, and 22 other attractions and rides, including a roller coaster that will spin you upside down. The West Edmonton Mall is unique. It's Edmonton's best-known attraction, and unlike anything else in the world. Edmonton is a great city, sophisticated, cultured, fun, and Canada's gateway to the north.
The following morning at 9.05, the Canadian departs from Edmonton to the west. We have a new head-in crew on board that will take us on to the Rockies. Today, the scenery changes. Low plains give way to rising terrain as the mountains loom up ahead. We pass endless freights loaded with grain moving west to the Canadian ports. The train builds speed as we head west past lakes and valleys onto the Rocky Mountain Range. Passengers crowd in the observation dome to view the scenery, which is the main attraction of the day. The train curves back and forth around the lakes and mountains as the land rises rapidly at the foot of the range. We are heading west through the Rockies towards the Yellowhead Pass. When the original surveys of the mountains were done in the 1870s, there was endless debate about which pass to use. The Canadian Pacific opted for the Kicking Horse Pass to the south. It wasn't until 1915 when the Grand Trunk and Canadian Northern began building their lines west that the Yellowhead Pass was used. We will be passing through the Yellowhead Pass as we move toward the Pacific Coast. But before we do, we're going to leave the train at Jasper, Alberta for a few days of adventure in the heart of the Canadian Rockies. The Canadian approaches Jasper on the mainline tracks of the Canadian National. This was the route of the supercontinental CN's transcontinental train. Jasper stands in the center of Jasper National Park. Unlike Banff to the south, which is mostly a tourist town, Jasper was, for many years, an active commercial center. The Canadian National maintained large railroad yards here, and the town was a primary switching point as the freights were assembled to head east and west. Jasper feels like a chalet village. The architecture is vaguely Bavarian. In summer, it's very busy with travelers from around the world. Some arrive by train, others come in on coaches and by car. This is mountain country. Surrounding Jasper are some of the most spectacular mountains of the world. This is toward the northern end of the massive Rocky Mountain Range that begins in New Mexico and ends north of British Columbia. The mountains are somewhat lower than those in the U.S. Most of the peaks are between 9 and 11,000 feet, but the shapes are very dramatic. The spring runoff creates churning rivers that drop dramatically, creating some of the world's most impressive waterfalls. Outside of the town of Jasper stands the Jasper Park Lodge. The Jasper Park Lodge had very humble beginnings. It started out as a tent camp in 1915, begun by Fred and Jack Brewster, who were the tourism pioneers of this region. In 1921, the Grand Trunk Railroad took over the tent camp and built eight log cabins. The setting is beautiful on Lake Bavare with Mount Edith Cavell looming ahead. Over the years, it has expanded into a 437-room resort. One of its most interesting features is its highly mobile room service. If you call room service here and order breakfast, lunch, or dinner, it will be delivered by a bellman on a bicycle, regardless of the weather. The lodge is a true resort offering endless outdoor activities. You can rent a canoe or a kayak and paddle across the lake, and tennis courts offer magnificent vistas into the Rocky Mountain Range. The golf course is world-renowned. Built in 1924, it took 200 men and 50 teams of horses to create. It was designed by the world-famous golf architect, Stanley Thompson. Horseback riding has been a popular activity here since the Brewsters pitched their first tents and started inviting travelers from the east. Each day, the trail masters saddle up the horses and lead people staying at the lodge on the trails around the lake, past rivers, and through valleys of the mountain range. 
magnificent scenery forms a backdrop along the trails, and the experience is typical of the outdoor adventures this region provides. Through the region pass several churning rivers that flow out of the mountains and lakes. Whitewater rafting is one of the activities the Jasper Park Lodge provides. Participants carry the rafts to the river's edge and receive a few instructions before starting out. And depending on your mood and sense of daring, you can experience anything from a gentle flow trip to a hair-raising rapids adventure. Today we're going to run the Athabascan River. This journey starts below the Athabascan Falls and will run the river for about 10 miles. The whole thing takes about 45 minutes and it's a pretty good way to, quite literally, get your feet wet. But if you'd like a bigger thrill, the lodge will take you the other direction, to the Moline River. This is one of the Rockies' most beautiful spots. The river joins Moline and Medicine Lakes, and when they hand you a helmet, you'll know this ride is going to be a little less calm. This is a true whitewater trip. The river is running at nearly full force, and the raft runners will guarantee you a dramatic ride. The raft set out from Moline Lake and enter the outflow as they start this wild river journey. Rafting in the Rockies is one of the highlights of staying at the Jasper Park Lodge. For other travelers, the Jasper Tramway offers its own thrills. This is the longest cable car in Canada. It opened in 1964 and takes 30 passengers at a time to the top of Whistler Mountain. The ride takes seven minutes and crosses one tower en route to the mountain peak. A conductor on board offers a running commentary as people peer out of the car into the Rocky Mountain range. At the summit, passengers leave the tram and explore the mountain top. The giant wheels turn rapidly as the cable car makes its way back down the slope. This is Whistler Mountain. It is about 600 million years old and consists mainly of sandstone and shale. It receives its name from the whistling marmots that cover the slopes. The temperature drops rapidly and though it was almost hot at the base, a jacket and sweater are a must up here. Even in June, when this film was shot, some snow remains. From the top, you can see 70 miles west to Mount Robeson and 60 miles south to the Columbia Ice Fields. It's one of the best distance viewing spots in the entire mountain range. Connecting Jasper and Lake Louise is the Ice Fields Parkway. It is no exaggeration to say that this is one of the most beautiful stretches of road in the world. For 140 miles, the view is truly mesmerizing. One breathtaking mountain after another. The Icefields Parkway passes through the center of Canada's two best known national parks, Jasper and Banff. Jasper National Park includes the town of Jasper and stretches south to the Columbia Icefield. The park offers outdoor activities ranging from bicycling to camping and hiking through the range. 
The scenery is inspiring. The scale almost beyond words. For many visitors, Jasper National Park's greatest thrill is its abundant wildlife. Few places of the world offer such a collection of wild animals roaming everywhere you go. Mountain goats are so common, cars often have trouble getting through on the roads. Deer and elk will graze right down to the edge of the camps. And the bighorn sheep are so tame that you can get remarkably close. Jasper National Park is a wildlife photographer's dream. Even the bears seem unaffected by people. These scenes were taken right alongside the Icefields Parkway with the cars buzzing by. Wildlife abounds in this region of beautiful lakes and snow-capped peaks, but the region's most popular attractions are the massive glaciers that spill out of the Columbia ice fields and down the mountainsides. The Brewster brothers, who hold almost legendary status in these parts, built this chalet to house visitors to the Athabascan Glacier. The Brewsters developed a bus on big tires they called a snow coach. The first ones were fairly primitive, but over the years they have grown into these Star War-like vehicles that move people over the glacier for an adventure on the ice. This is a bumpy ride. The coach is moving along at about four miles an hour, and in spite of the tire size, the rocking is pretty severe. Each spring, a new snow trail has to be created. This is not a permanent road. It is always melting, freezing, snowing, and melting again. This is not a stable trail, though the ice is actually several hundred feet thick. At the end of the snowy road, the passengers disembark and walk out onto the ice. This was the first glacier walk attraction up North America. Since it began, thousands of people have had the experience of wandering out over the Athabascan Glacier that spills out of the massive Columbia ice field high overhead. From the Athabascan Glacier, we continue south and soon pass from Jasper into Banff National Park. The Icefields Parkway connects the Columbia Icefields with Lake Louise and Banff to the south. At times, the scale of the scenery, the size of the mountains, the height of the waterfalls, and the thickness of the ice cause us to overlook nature's more delicate sights. Lovely wildflowers bloom from spring to autumn, covering the fields and valley floors.
At the southern end of the parkway, we arrive at two of Canada's best-known destinations, Lake Louise and Banff. The tracks of the Canadian Pacific pass through these resorts, and for 34 years, the Canadian took the southern route, stopping in Banff and Lake Louise rather than Jasper to the north. Lake Louise is one of the most picturesque spots on Earth. It stands in front of towering mountains, glaciers pouring off the slopes. The spot is almost mystical at times. On the shores of the lake stand the world-famous Chateau Lake Louise. Like the Jasper Park Lodge, its origins were humble, initially a small cabin for passengers off of the train. But the railroad saw the potential of this spot and erected a hotel on the site worthy as a travel destination unto itself. Giant yellow poppies surround the hotel and grow wild in the nearby field. The Canadian Pacific Railroad built and continues to operate this hotel. At one end of the lobby is one of the most glorious picture windows of the world, framing a true postcard view. The feeling inside is that of a Bavarian chalet. The atmosphere is old world, friendly and warm, a carry back to another time when travel was less rush, and people traveling through Canada on the Canadian could stop and spend a few days. Nearby to Lake Louise is Moraine Lake. This is often called the most photographed lake in the world. Millions of cameras have been aimed at this spot. This vista is even printed on the back of the Canadian $20 bill. On to the east a short distance is the town of Banff. This is a charming though somewhat commercialized spot that still does retain some of its turn of the century character. Banff is best known for the Banff Springs Hotel. This colossal pile, and there is no other word that describes it so well, was built in 1888 as the first of the great railway hotels. A statue of William Cornelius Van Horn, chairman of the Canadian Pacific when the railroad was built, stands out front. A plaque is inscribed with his best known quote, since we can't export the scenery, we'll have to import the tourists. Inside the hotel is an interesting collection of old silver plate off the Canadian Pacific's early trains. Much of this heavy railroad silver was used aboard the original Canadian from 1955 until 1989. One of Banff's best known attractions is the gondola lift that runs to the top of Sulphur Mountain. The ride offers a panoramic view along the way. At the summit, your view stretches as far as the eye can see as you take in the scope and size of the Rocky Mountain Range. From Banff, we now drive back to Jasper, turn in our rental car, and prepare to reboard the train. At Jasper, the train is serviced, fuel is added, the cars are watered, the brakes checked, and a new engine crew is brought on board. Here, the windows are washed. 2,000 miles of travel has left more than a few dead bugs on the front part of the observation dome. 
From Jasper, the train now heads west toward the Yellowhead Pass. Today the Canadian rolls on the tracks of the Canadian National through the northern Yellowhead Pass. But this low, easy pass was not the first one used. When the Canadian Pacific began to build Canada's first transcontinental train, nothing caused more argument than the selection of the pass. The Yellowhead was easy. It was low and the grades could be contained. The kicking horse pass to the south was high and would require grades that were dangerously steep. Today, as the Canadian heads west through the Yellowhead Pass, we travel alongside spectacular scenery. Mount Robeson, Canada's highest peak, looms off to the north. Why wasn't the ZZ Pass used? Why the difficult Southern Pass? It was because of the Americans. At the time, Canada's west was almost completely unsettled. There was fear that the Americans would simply walk across the 49th parallel and declare the land their own. So the southern route, closer to the border, with the difficult and dangerous Kicking Horse Pass was chosen so the area would be settled quickly in order to keep the Americans away. Dinner in the diner, nothing could be finer. An old refrain from a nostalgic song, and today it's as true as ever. Dining aboard the Canadian is one of the most relaxing aspects of this travel experience. Passengers order from a fairly extensive menu, and everything is prepared to order on board. There are no microwaves in the dining car. All of the food is prepared fresh each day. Working in the galley is a job that requires a good sense of balance. The Canadian runs on continuous welded track and the ride is fairly smooth, but the 80 to 90 mile an hour speed makes for enough jostling in the dining car and galley to keep the chefs and dining car stewards on their toes. Dining cars on board trains are a great place to make new friends. Everyone must share tables, otherwise all of the passengers couldn't be served. And after introductions are made, most passengers find their nightly table mates to be interesting. Everyone shares, by virtue of the trip, a common love of trains. As we finish our dinner, the Canadian is heading west, coming out of the Rockies and heading out over the rolling highlands of central BC en route to our next stop, the historic mining town of Kamloops. Kamloops is, if nothing else, a railroad town. The main lines of the Canadian National and Canadian Pacific meet at this point. Kamloops lies in the lower central part of British Columbia between the Rockies to the east and the coast mountains to the west. The population is about 70,000 and the feeling is that of a rugged railroad and ranching town. The city hugs the Thompson River that runs through the heart of town and the rail lines and extensive switching yards make the trains an integral part of the commerce and economy of the region. A small excursion boat takes people down the river and lets them see how quickly the city disappears and the ranch lands begin. This is farm country, but not quite the same as the prairie lands. Here there are rolling hills. The land is much more picturesque and the farms tend to be somewhat smaller in their operations. 
There are extensive dairy operations in this part of B.C. and the scenes of cattle, horses, and other livestock, as well as the red-painted barns, are typical of the interior of B.C. B.C.'s farming wealth is dependent on irrigation. Much of the region is fairly arid, and only by tapping the mountain water supplies are farmers able to irrigate the fields and make the region productive. Like many places dependent on irrigation, few people ever consider the possibility of drought. But in recent years, B.C., like much of the Pacific Northwest, has suffered from little rain, and the limited water supplies have created predictable friction between the city populations and the farmers who are dependent on a regular supply. One of the region's oldest and largest industries is timber. Tall stands of pines and firs cover hundreds of thousands of acres in the central part of B.C. The huge logging trucks can be seen throughout this part of the province. They are on their way to sawmills and pulp mills, which are the largest employers in central B.C. Logging is controversial. No one would argue that lumber is, of course, necessary. In spite of all of today's modern materials, lumber is still used in great quantities to build our homes. The resource, unlike fossil fuels, is renewable. But how that resource is managed gives room for many different environmental views. Here the argument is over clear cutting. It is still done, but in more limited degree. BC is trying to manage environmental concerns against economic and human needs, and the dilemma inevitably leads to dissension between opposing sides. The pulp industry is one of the region's leading employers, but it is also a source of environmental concern. Canada is ahead of the U.S. in managing its ecological matters, but the further north you go, away from the border and the population centers, the more lax the standards become, and Canada is by no means without environmental concerns. A short distance from Kamloops, the scenery changes. To the south, beautiful lakes offer activities for people from throughout the northwest. Through the region runs the Trans-Canada Highway, Highway Number 1. It stretches across the country. It is mostly two-lane. Canada has less four-lane cross-country highway development than the states. Kelowna lies 70 miles from Kamloops and is a lovely lake resort town. A modern outdoor sculpture stands beside the lake. It's the symbol of Kelowna and quite an impressive sight. This is vineyard country and the gentle slopes that rise up from the shore of the lake are covered with grape arbors, and in the autumn, the grapes will be harvested and processed in the wineries of B.C. B.C. wines have become well-known in recent years. The grapes, because of the climate, produce wines of distinctive body and taste. To the west of Kamloops lies a part of B.C. with a different appearance. Mountain streams give way to canyon country, here, the Fraser River flows out of the mountains on its way to the sea. The Fraser River Canyon played a very important role in the history of Canadian trains. In addition to battling over which pass would be used through the Rockies, the planners of the route also argued over which Pacific port would be best. BC's only real settlement at the time was Victoria out on the island. Vancouver as a city really didn't exist. The decision to terminate the line at Vancouver rather than several alternate ports was due to this river gorge, which, though not easy, was manageable for laying the tracks. The Canadian Pacific built most of its line on the south banks of the river. By 1915, both the Grand Trunk and the Canadian Northern were building their lines mostly on the north side of the gorge. Today, if you stand on the river's edge, you may catch a glimpse of two different freights using the tracks at the same time. These two main line tracks are among the busiest rail lines of the world. Dozens of freights move on opposite sides of the Fraser River day and night, hauling goods to and from the Pacific coast. 
While the romance of passenger trains is appealing, the heart of the railroad is this, giant lumbering freights that move goods coast to coast. Canadian freight trains are often 100 cars in length. They are among the longest freight trains in the world. The trains still provide the most efficient way to move goods to and from the deep water ports out over a sprawling nation of nearly 3,500 miles in width. A sign above the river marks the spot where the last spike of the Canadian Northern was driven. It was the last spike of Canada's third transcontinental railroad. The first last spike was driven on the Canadian Pacific here at Kregalaki. This was the end of a tumultuous project, but unlike the Union Pacific, the railroad had been built in pieces. A section here, a section there, and the last spike was not a historic joining together of the east and west, but rather the last spike in a piecemeal system that had taken 14 years to complete. On November the 7th of 1885, the railroad was finished. It was the completion of a national dream. From Kamloops, the Canadian rolls through the Coast Mountains and into the Fraser River Canyon, making its way west on the final leg of the trip. When we arrive in Vancouver at 8 a.m., we will be completing a journey that has taken three days and three nights, covered 2,800 miles, crossed five provinces, the Great Lakes, the Prairies, the Mountains, and the Canyons of the West. This is one of the longest passenger rail journeys of the world. arriving in Canada's most important western port, Vancouver, a sparkling city surrounded by water and mountains, temperate and home to a million and a half people. The Canadian approaches from the east on tracks that lead directly into Vancouver's Main Street Station, a great old railway station built in 1919. Here the passengers leave the train. We are at the end of the line. People pass through the station, under the central clock, a fixture in any rail terminal, and emerge in front of the station, ready to explore the town. Vancouver is Canada's great West Coast city. It is a modern city, almost everything is new. It began its explosive growth in only the past 30 years. It is Canada's link to the Far East, and the population includes large groups of Asian immigrants. The Hotel Vancouver stands in the heart of town. It is one of Vancouver's largest hotels and one of the last of the great railway chateau hotels to be built. It is impressive and gracious and still a center of activity in the heart of Vancouver. This is a world-class city. It boasts spectacular new architecture, a vibrant economic base, culture, recreation, a high standard of living, and compared to other cities of similar size, urban problems that are manageable and not out of hand. The population represents a mix of everything Canada has to offer, immigrants from Asia and Europe, and Canadians who have moved here from the prairies and the east, some for the mild weather, others for culture or jobs, and many for just the excitement a city like this provides. The Granville Street Bridge passes over an island almost in the center of town. This is Granville Island. For years, it was purely industrial, filled with warehouses and the shipping trade. Today, those businesses still exist, but developers have also created shops, markets, entertainment, and endless restaurants and cafes. This is one of Vancouver's most popular spots. It has become an active center for street entertainers and musicians, and many people of Vancouver will make their way here on Saturdays and Sundays to buy fresh food and fish at the public market on the pier. 
Vancouver began here in Gastown, a turn-of-the-century part of town that began to develop once the railroad arrived. In the center of Gastown is a historic town clock, the steam clock. It operates by, of all things, steam. City steam that is pumped under the streets as a public utility. The clock, pendulum, and weights are powered this way, and four times an hour, the chime sounds using wheezing old steam whistles. It's a curious attraction and very interesting to watch. Canada Place stands on the water next to the old Canadian Pacific Station. This is a sprawling new pier that was built for Vancouver's Expo and today acts as the terminal for the nearly two dozen different cruise ships that sail from Vancouver to Alaska during the summer months. The ships sail west through the harbor and under the Lionsgate Bridge. This suspension bridge is one of Vancouver's best-known sites. It links downtown with all of the communities on the North Shore. It is one of Vancouver's busiest thoroughfares. The road over the bridge passes through the center of Stanley Park. This is Vancouver's best known public park. It is only minutes from downtown and is filled with people on weekends enjoying the outdoors. There are marinas, bike paths, jogging trails, and lots of different things to do. The park's best known attraction is a colorful group of totem poles. These brightly colored totems have stood in the park for a very long time. They are authentic and represent various Indian tribes scattered throughout BC. The figures on these totem poles represent families, events, and the leaders of each clan. They do not, in most cases, represent gods or spirituality. They were carved to record the stories, the heritage, and the history of a people, not as idols of worship, which is commonly thought. The Canadian terminates in Vancouver, but Victoria, BC's capital out on Vancouver Island, has a strong connection with Canada's original transcontinental train. When British Columbia was being enticed into the newly formed Confederation, Victoria was the only settlement of any size. The planners of the railroad wanted to build the train to operate to Victoria by loading the train onto ferry boats, as is common in Europe. The plan was never carried out, and today Victoria remains unconnected to the main line of the train. Victoria today is Canada's most charming city. It is more English than London, and its sense of grace and ease are world-renowned. This is the capital of British Columbia, and the legislature building on the water is famous for the Christmas-like outline of lights that glow across the harbor each night. The town is filled with buskers, street entertainers, tourists, and local people going about their day. Carriages move visitors through Victoria, and the overall feeling is like that of being in an English seashore town. Victoria's best-known gathering spot is the Empress Hotel. This is not just a hotel, this is a BC institution. It was built by the Canadian Pacific shortly after the turn of the century, anticipating that the train would eventually deliver passengers directly here. This never happened, but the hotel was an immediate success. The Empress is most famous for tea. Tea in the lobby of the Empress at 4 o'clock goes back to the earliest days of the hotel. It reflects its English traditions and continues as popular as ever today. The quiet background sounds of clinking silver and animated conversation create an ambiance like that of the early trains, when travel was more leisurely and less rushed, a time when travel was to be savored and enjoyed. From Victoria, we return by ferry to Vancouver and head to Union Station in the heart of downtown. At 9 o'clock tonight, the Canadian will depart to the east. 
The story of Canada and the story of the railroad are in many respects one and the same. The building of the railroad united the nation. It created a national dream that was realized through hard work, tenacity, and the vision of optimistic men and women over a century ago. Pierre Burton, Canada's great writer and rail historian, wrote, We have little blood in our history, no searing civil war, no surgical revolution. We are the only nation in the world created non-violently by the building of a railroad. Today, the Canadian continues to travel both east and west across a great land. It speaks of the spirit of Canada, its people, and the noble link this nation has to its endless miles of silver rails. The Canadian is one of the last great passenger trains of the world, an experience enjoyed each year by thousands of devoted and enthusiastic travelers who still appreciate and understand the magic of a train. Greatest train ride video adventure.